Yeah, I'd much rather have. I'm I'm more used to being in front of people and speaking and talk, looking at my computer talking. So to, to start the thing out with, uh, this is uh, John Weber's here beside me. He's inside sales in Mobile Marine, and he's kind of kicking me around a little bit trying to get some of these things uh, webinars going just to reach out and, and try to get things going in the Mobile Marine again. And so uh, below the his, his contact information is tech support, and we're here, for, like it says, from 6 to 5, and the call-in number is below that. And that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into this. And I'm going to hit the start. And here we go. So uh, that being said, um, this is our, our two inverters for the, uh, 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 this would be the FX inverters. And the one on the left is the sealed. And the one on the right is vented. And you can see the one on the right has a hole in the top for the fan that's going to suck air through and blow it out along the bottom areas right, right along through here. So it sucks air in, cools all the unit, and then blows air out here. The good thing about it is instead of a 3,000 watt inverter you would have over here, you would have a 3,600 watt, a little bit more power. Uh, there is a screen underneath here to keep uh, small bugs and small animals out, but there's also this uh, uh, mesh over the top just to clean the air. It's a filter. This over here doesn't have that, and in a way, this is how we got into that was we were conversing with people in Hawaii uh, back in, you know, 2000 or, or whenever Outback really did start, and they said, we need a sealed inverter because over here we've got extreme salt air and moisture and if you suck that air through across the electronics it just kills them instantly. I mean he showed me pictures of uh, inverters that have been out there for like uh, oh I think it was three months and they're completely corroded. So that's where we kind of got into the mobile market a, a little bit there with the, the sealed inverter and uh, so that's how the sealed inverter come about. And you'll notice a little bit later on we have a thing called a turbo. And the turbo right here, it's run off the aux output. And this is just a fan. And this mounts right up here. And what it does is it takes air and blows it down and around the inverter itself. And this whole inverter section here is a heat sink. There's a fan on the interior that circulates air on the interior. And it's it, it's routed to the outside and the fan cools it down and so we get a little bit more power out of it that way also. So that's the two inverters we have, the sealed and the uh, the, the non-sealed and there's reasons for either. So uh, that being said, I want to talk a little bit about our nomenclature. FX means it's an inverter. You'll see an FX over here also. The V is for the vented units, so a VFX is just a vented inverter. 2812, you put two zeros behind the 28, that's the amount of power it has, 2,800 watts, 3,500 watts, 2,000 watts, and the last is your DC voltage, uh, 12, 24, 32, 36, and 48. And what we have these 32 and 36 is for some of the uh, uh, the vessels operate on the, they operate off the 32 and the 36 volts, and so we, we offer inverter for those vessels that do. Uh, kind of an odd ball, but I believe some of the old uh, Coast Guard boats and some of the uh, older fishing boats had that. So that's how our nomenclature uh, comes around. The M just means the mobile, and the T is for the turbo, and you notice we don't have a T over here for the turbo over here. So that's how we kind of label all of our gear. Uh, there's a reason for that, and, and that was the reason. Uh, we also have, uh, we've come out with a 48 volt in the European voltages, the 23050 hertz is again, FX would be a field, 2000 watt, 12 volt, European was the mobile and the turbo was on these units here and again we have the vented. So if you're in foreign countries or foreign vessels, we still have a, 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 um, a voltage for the 23050 uh, hertz. And uh, this is what the AC control or the AC board looks like on a mobile inverter. And it's much the same as the standard inverter, but what we have here is a neutral ground jumper right here. And what this is, without back inverters, we can hook up all up to 10 inverters into a system. So with the neutral ground switching, as in any 
uh, uh, electronic uh, distribution system, you're going to have a single neutral ground point in the AC. And this is establishes it. So if you have one inverter, you want to make sure that that little jumper is in. If you've got, you know, up to 10 inverters, you'll only need one in one of the inverters. And usually we say put it in the master. It just seems to make more sense. It could be in any of the following inverters. But really, if you stick it in the master, then you'll know where to look for it. And you would remove that jumper in any of our slaves. And if you're not aware of our, our nomenclature with the master and slave, I'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, so, uh, and again, Mark, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in, throw rocks at me, do whatever you think works, you know. Yeah, we've, we've put some in before, and, and I thought if we wanted the switching, we would leave that jumper in. So I think even on the slaves, I've left the jumper in. Yeah, and uh, I think somewhere in there, yeah, actually right here, uh, if there is more than one mobile unit FX in this, yeah. move the copper bus from every slave FX. Okay. So that, that's, uh, you know, it, it may not be critical, but at the same, usually you want one uh, neutral ground connection in any AC system. So, uh, and this, uh, well, go ahead, sir. Okay, so, you know, that all being said, this is really where you're, all your AC inputs, you're going to notice this little terminal switch down here. How you would hook up uh, either the turbo fan, or if you want to have an uh, an AGS system, AGS meaning automatic uh, uh, generator start, you're going to hook it. You're going to hook it up to the AGS over here, and we can automatically start a two wire generator on uh, on command if you have a maintenance system. So we can do automatic gen gen starts on uh, up to five different conditions uh, to start a generator. So, uh, and this is on that little terminal that was back here. This is the inverter on-off switches right here. And we're getting a closer look at that. And on the older gear, we used to just have a little jumper that went in right here. And then we thought, hey, you know, why don't we actually make a micro switch jumper? This is the size of your little, little finger a nail. So it just stands, and there's two little... Uh, two little pins right here and this just makes a connection between them two pins. So this is this will be used for a remote on off for the inverter. So if you choose not to use a mate uh, or have any external device, you could turn the inverter section on off with this. And that being said, what I would like to emphasize is it's not just hooked up to an AC input. Our inverters see the AC input and we say, all right, I'm going to deter determine if that's good and if I accept that and when I accept that, that AC input is going to flow directly through me, through my, my internal relay system, and it's going to run all the uh, loads on my output and I'm going to turn into a battery. If you starve this for an AC input, it instantly is going to turn over and say, all right, now I am going to invert and provide power to the loads on my output. Now, this, in, this little switch here turns the inverter off. And I want to emphasize, it just turns the inverter section off. If you have an AC input, it's still going to pass through, and it's still going to act as a battery charger, even with the jumper removed. So it's just an, an on-off switch. I guess the reasons to have this would be, I don't know about you, but I've lived on a boat in the Denver Marina here, a small city, and often, often in storms when I come back, often in storms when I come back, uh, you'll see the power switch dangling in the water, you know, or the cord dangling in the water. So if you had the inverter section off and there wasn't any critical loads in here, what you would do, when that comes unplugged, you wouldn't have the chance of running your batteries down. So it's just another control. You can use it or you don't have to. It's not really a, it's not a widely used function, but nonetheless, I see a use for it in certain situations. Uh, so um, I'm going to go on. And also, we have some, um, because of the toughness of our gear and how rugged we seem to be, one thing we're, we're kind of noted for, you know, just reliability and ease of use. And we've actually got some um, 
an OBX system out. And what it is is Outback Extreme. And these are made for military use. We are in several military vehicles. We've got a military section. So if you ever come across that and they want a ruggedized unit, what we've done is we've taken the, the capacitors that are in our normal unit and put an encapsulant around them so that they can't individually vibrate. You know, we're pretty tough anyway, but they said, hey, if you make this rugged, we'll do this. And then they said, you know what, we also need something to mount on the outside of our trucks and it has to be waterproof. And this develop, this unit here, the S, is submersible. And it just kind of gives you a little idea, you know, of some of the directions we're headed. Uh, this is made to mount on the outside of a vehicle that can forge streams over in Iraq and Iran and different war zones. And the idea was this, to be able to submerge it up to three feet, and within five minutes after pulling it out, you can plug this in and it'll power up and work. You'll see the slightly different style of uh, connections here. So it's an automotive sealed connection on there. And so it's just, you know, kind of some of the fun stuff we've done. Uh, we also, on the Extreme series, uh, the Outback Extreme, I had the good fortune to going over to, uh, 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 over to a modern day Marine. And I was walking through the crowd and I saw this Cougar and this is a military vehicle. And over on the right here, this is one of our inverters mounted inside that vehicle. And this window up here is actually this window right here. So our unit is mounted just right inside that doorway there. So I got a couple pictures of that. Had a blast at Modern Day Marine. It was really fun. I've never seen so many grown-up toys in my life. Um, so, you know, just, you know, just, I guess in a way it kind of proves our rug ability. Uh, and I mentioned earlier how we can be uh, programmed into larger systems. And so, okay, I just check on the time here trying to see how uh, last time I did this, I jetted through this, and uh, that's that. Uh, you know, and I shut off the mics so that I, I did, wasn't getting all the feedback. I'm going to turn Mark on for a second. Mark, if anything you want to add, uh, you all right? Yeah, yeah, doing fine. Okay. So uh, with this, you can uh, two systems can be stacked in series for either 120 or 120 240. So both of these could be on L1, or one could cover L1, and the other one could cover L2. And we also have uh, you can put us into a three-phase system. So on your boats, if you've got generators that are actually putting out three-phase power, you can put a single inverter on each leg and now we'll act as a three, you know, we'll charge up a battery, all three inverters, and we'll pass that through and run the loads and we'll also provide, when you shut that generator off, power to a smaller three-phase system. This would be, uh, three. if this is a 3,600 watt inverter, you would have 7.2 on either between the two hot legs. So, you know, we're, we're pretty versatile in that line. And also, you can hook up to 10 of ours together. Uh, I, I know it's a little bit crazy, but I've seen houses that run off a, a 36K system, but I could envision a ferry systems that, you know, you need quite large systems, larger boats. I mean, you know, there's a lot of rich people. I just saw uh, Bill Gates' boat, and it's it's bigger than about five of my houses put together. So it's, it's, it's amazing what's going on in the marine industry. One thing that's really come up is uh, with houseboats, and there's been several installers we've been working with down in Arizona on the large lakes down there, and they've been putting in four and five inverters into these houseboats just because they need house-level power uh, when they're out on the water um, with their house bank. Of course, it's a very large boat, and so they have large house banks. But there's plenty of examples out there where they're using multiple uh, inverters. Uh, another interesting install with multiple inverters is the Orca-class vessel, which is um, a Canadian training vessel for officers. And they actually have nine inverters uh, on the boat. And they chose some of those inverters just simply as chargers because they knew that Outback was a ruggedized um, device that wasn't going to fail. And so they have different banks. Um, some of it's backup, so for like their uh, fly-by-wire controls for the rudder and whatnot, 
Um, there's a backup system for that, but some of them are just used as bank chargers for the different battery banks that they have inside this um, training vessel. So, you know, how does this system kind of look? Well, all right, this would be an example of, we have two different types of stacking, basically. We've got a classic and outback. With a classic stacking, one inverter, the master, covers L1, and the other inverter just covers L2. They're 180 degrees out of phase with each other. And really, this one covers all the loads on L1. This one covers all the loads on L2. They're 180 degrees apart, so they work together for 240 volt loads. But they don't share power between the two legs. Uh, with outback stacking, let me go back up. Outback stacking, we put a transformer here. And what this does is transformer is kind of a, a multifaceted beast. In this mode, what it helps do is if you've got 1,000 watts of loads over on this one and 500 over here, this inverter can help bleed over and help run the loads. So the system as a whole is suddenly balanced. It just kind of helps balance so each inverter can help each other depending on the load sharing over here. So they just kind of work together to... Um, provide a little bit more seamless power. Another good thing about this is that if under low power situations at night, say, or when there's just, just low power, uh, this inverter can signal this other inverter to shut off and it can provide power to 12240 through this invor in inverter. And, you know, by the way, you could also just add this inverter and get rid of this and one inverter could power up two, two legs with this system. So that's some of the advantages of it. Uh, where it becomes more apparent is when you have larger systems and larger loads. Now suddenly this thing can help balance between a much larger system. And this would be what, you know, outback stacking. And by the way, with the outback stacking, this one could tell all these other inverters to run off under low power. It's still going to give you 120. And you've just diminished the load on your batteries overnight by three inverters. This is a 20 watts just sitting there. 20, 20, 40, 60 watts you're not taking out of your battery when you don't need it. And these will sequence on automatically on their own under power loads. So as the load cre increases, you could program it to have both these on and tell these to turn on. You could have it so just one inverter's on and you sequence them on as you need it. So it depends on the loads in your systems how you program that. Kind of in an interesting affair. And, you know, this is an example of our, our two inverter uh, FP2 is what we call it. And uh, this could come, you know, prepackaged like this just to hang on a bulkhead. Uh, for a lot of boats, this is going to be too big and overkill. But nonetheless, I just thought I'd bring it up in case you just said, hey, you know, I've got a nice bulkhead here and I'm going to hang this right here and there you go. And also, this would be an example of a, a, a quad stack with four inverters. And again, if you wanted to just a three-phase system, you could get rid of this inverter, and there's your three inverters with all your AC input and output bypass system right here. You could have extra load banks over here, so this can act as uh, your distribution panel. And this is your DC aspect over here, and you've got your, your DC breakers over here. One thing that you're kind of seeing a little bit, and I'll talk about this a little later, we do offer charge controllers. Uh, a little bit harder on smaller boats in that, you know, if you've got one or two panels, our, our charge controller can either be 60 or an 80 amp, and we can charge 12 to 48 volt battery, 12, 24, 36, or 48. So they can be programmed. Might be a bit large for smaller boats, but at the same time, uh, uh, it is available, and I wanted to bring that out. Um, John, you may want to address this. This is our, our two controllers that we have. Uh, this is the Mate on the left and the Mate 2 on the right. The Mate 2 just happens to fit in the old uh, Freedom Marine slots. So if you have, uh, oh, uh, what is it, it's the Link 1000 or 2000, then uh, it'll fit right into that same area so you don't have to recut. So one of the reasons for the webinar um, is that we are still doing a promotion to the end of 2012 um, through our marine distribution um, wards, fisheries, uh, seawide, just name a couple, but there's a list. I know that Fred's from um, one that's doing our um, promotion as well. So any mobile inverter that's sold uh, comes with a free mate control device. And part of that is because we know it's, 
it's so critical to be able to set the system up correctly the first time and be able to at a glance with just a couple button pushes look at what the battery voltage is what kind of loads you have and it really does help educate the uh, the end user and as well as the installer on getting it programmed for the battery bank correctly the first time because load times change um, regardless of what the factory settings are it's pretty rare that you're going to find a battery bank that needs exactly one hour charging some may need less some may need more uh, the other nice thing about these of course at a glance you can see the AC in light uh, or the inverter light and that at a glance you can tell very quickly if you've successfully attached the shore power if the AC in light is solid uh, then you do know that the the system is connected and you can see what the system's doing at that point if it's charging or if it's passing through if the AC in light is flashing but the inverter light is solid that means you've plugged into shore power you have an AC source but for some reason it's not grabbing on and it can take a minute or so for the system to sync up but um, if it goes much longer than that you definitely have an issue with probably a voltage window and I know that um, some installers have commented that when you get out to the end of a dock um, you're the last boat out of, you're the furthest away from um, the shore power essentially you can get a huge voltage drop you can see 108 102 98 volts way out there and so from with factory settings you can't grab onto that because our minimum setting is set at 108 volts with the Outback system you can actually open that window up even further and possibly grab onto it now it may not be healthy for the system to be passing through 100 volts to to the boat but uh, you can force the Outback system to grab onto that and at least start charging um, or at least just know what's going on with the vessel itself if you're actually successfully attached to the um, to the grid and and passing that energy through so uh, moving on here we've also come across well this is the the made on the left is we've had for oh, 10 10 11 years now and also the one on the right we've developed a new mate to address some of the situations with with these mates over here you've got uh, two buttons and four buttons down here so a total of six buttons to access about 499 screens so it, it's a little cumbersome and you know one of the interesting things about about Outback is we give you complete control over your system uh, like John was saying a lot of times you're if you're voltage is 108 volts from the factory this is going to say okay we can accept that I see it it's 108 I will hook up to that I'll uh, let that pass through run the loads and I am going to be a battery charger but if that voltage drops down to 107 it's going to say well you told me not to use anything below 108 so with the mate you can drop that down and it's just a way of adjusting things and unfortunately also People tend to get lost in the screen, and if you've got a button pusher that just gets in there and starts pressing buttons, he can change things around so you don't know what he's changed. And a lot of times here we'll get calls, hey, my system isn't charging anymore, your, your unit's broke. And we, we go in there and press the ACN button three times, and you go to the charger screen, and you turn the charger back on. So, I mean, you can turn the AC input to don't use, you can turn the charger off, and you can turn the invert off so you've got a perfectly working system doing exactly what you told it but nothing is happening because you literally told it to do nothing so and even though the um, you know the, the mate or the mate 2 is part of the promotion if you have installers who who are complaining about button pushers then the mate 3 could be a possible uh, solution as well since you can lock people out of uh, certain levels so you can actually put an installer password in and that allows you to control several different levels from only be able to use the the hot keys to, to view things all the way down to advanced controls and in between so um, and the other nice thing is is if an installer does set up with the mate 3 they can save those settings and if somebody goes totally gaga they can at least walk them through a couple button pushes to re-update the whole system with how it was set up the first time so um, you know tech support is fantastic here at Outback and we're open from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time but not uh, Saturday or Sunday and so 
Uh, you can, That's why uh, I gave you John's number, so yeah. you can call him on Saturday and Sunday, and he always wakes up at 4 in the morning, so don't worry. Yeah, I'm available 24-7 through email if you needed me, and I'd be happy to get back to you. But um, the Mate 3 does provide a few different things. It's not part of the promotion, but it may be a better match to what the, the end user uh, would like to use. I know that I'm speaking with um, a boat manufacturer, and they're actually going to use the Mate 3 um, and just set up different settings. So they have a 65-foot boat, a 75-foot boat, um, and a 60-foot boat. And they're simply going to factory install the, the Mate 3 to, to set up the system and then put a Mate in. So it can be a great tool for an installer to have in their toolbox, if you will, uh, to simply easily use a wizard to set up the whole system and then plug the classic Mate into it so that they now have a complete system program. They're not trying to remember how to do it for the umpteenth time. Um, the only thing that this doesn't do, if you move mates, you also take away your automatic generator start. The automatic generator start is the one thing that will go with the mate, because the mate is controlling it. So while you can program the inverters and the charge controllers, you can't program the advanced generator start, um, because that's part of the mate's capability. So you pull them eight and you swap them, now you lose it. And that's something to note that if you do, um, somebody comes in and says, yeah, I think my mate fell in the water or got damaged, I need a new mate. It's really important to remind them, do you have a generator? Well, yeah, I have a generator and the mate does, or the inverter system does a great job of starting it. You're going to have to reprogram that because we're giving you a different mate. Oh, okay. So it's, it's definitely worth um, a question. Another thing that's kind of nice is there is this little button up here, the events log, and you could, there's an SD card that sits right over to the side here, and all these events can be written to that card, so you could go to a customer, write that to that card, take that card out, put it in your computer, and see all the events that have been logged for the last, well, 128 events, I believe it is. So you can see a file with everything that happened that this noted. So it's kind of good for troubleshooting. Hey, my system died. Well, it didn't die. You ran the batteries down, and you can see over here, right here, how they you know went down. And it's really interesting. Uh, uh, you've got a whole lot more screen capability, too. So instead of just one or two lines with information, you've got like five lines with uh, uh, graphs. And it, it's it's pretty interesting animal. Well, you know what? It, We've listened to people over the last 10 years going, I wish your mate did this, I wish your mate did that. New ideas come out. So we've tried to incorporate those new ideas and capabilities in this unit. Um, I'm going to unmute. Okay, I'm going to unmute for a second here. And just if you guys have anything to add or any questions at this point, uh, feel free to speak up. I don't want to just talk in, at a vacuum. I've had some issues with the X240 transformer. Um, I put it on a single phase boat, but some of these docks are fed with three phase. And we, we, if we get two lines of three phase, this happened some years back, but I think I was experiencing a lot of current going through the X240 transformer. So I've been hesitant to use that in the marine application because of what they may plug into. And it is a 120-240 device. It, it's, it's not meant to go between a, a phase shift of, uh, of 120 as opposed to 180. Yeah, the boat will be a 120-240 boat, but you never know what they plug into the dock, and if they don't have a transformer on the shore power input, you know, I've run into some real problems there. Now, remind me, uh, Mark, typically the, the plug is completely different uh, between a three-phase system and a two-phase system. Are they going and buying yeah. their own plug um, and trying no, to... What what's happening is, is uh, the marinas are providing a single-phase plug but the single phase plug is actually being fed with two lines of three phase rather than a true single phase. And we're seeing that quite a bit. Interesting. Uh, so the voltage there is usually if you take a three phase. Two eight. Usually if you take. Two oh eight. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's 208 volts you end up seeing, but they're feeding a single phase boat with that 208 volts. Or in some cases they're boosting it, but it's still 120 degrees out. Yeah, that's yeah, that's strictly a 120, 240 type arrangement on that. Yeah, it's just the the, man, the boat owner doesn't know what he's 
plugging into sometimes doesn't realize that it's two legs of three phase, even though it's a single phase plug on the dock, you know? Yeah, and you know we get that with our our newest inverter, the Radiant. It's a it's a an eight thousand watt unit, and you can stick ten of them together. And we're getting these going down to Mexico, and you know different countries, and people don't realize it's a one twenty two oh eight. And if the voltage is kind of high, people see one twenty five two ten, and it's a one twenty two forty and one hundred eighty degrees phase shift, and you know, it's pretty hard unless you have a scope to look at that to tell the heck that's not, you know, 180 degrees out of phase, it's 120. Yeah, it usually tips us off the voltage unless they were boosting the voltage. But yeah, I've had, so I, I've quit using the X220, uh, or sorry, well, you, you used to call it the X240, I think, transformer. Yeah. Unless they have an isolation transformer on the shore power coming in. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, the, on a three phase boat, I mean, we have one right now that we're getting ready to power up the inverter system. It's a 130-foot boat. Um, they only have two outback inverters running the, um, like, UPS loads. Um, it's a three-phase boat. I only have two inverters on one line, uh, or sorry, on two lines of the three-phase, but I do not use an X240 transformer. There shouldn't be any issues with that, should there? I'm only feeding single-phase 120-volt loads, and, but I am in a series or a 120-240 configuration. Uh, yeah, I would imagine that you're going to want to set that up as a three-phase system because what's going to happen is you're going to, the master is going to say, all right, if you're a, a 120-240, the slave has to be 180 degrees out of phase with me. And when it sees that, the slave is going to, if it passes that, accepts that 120 and passes it through, it's really a three-phase 120-208. Well, if we feed through, if we just feed through, um, we're probably putting through 120.208 on the feed through. If we invert, we'll probably have 120.240. Yeah. But am I really going to cause any issues? Because I'm only feeding 120 volt loads with this. Yeah, and as long as you don't have 200 and uh, you know any three phase loads that need the phase shift, uh, you might be all right. I, I can't say as I like it because it's just you know it's not. You know, it just so if you only have uh, 120 loads on both of those inverters, it would still behoove you to stack them um, for an ABC, so three-leg system. So stack uh, the first inverter as an A and a B instead of line one, line two, which would be split phase. Because you don't have, sorry, you don't have any 240 loads. You only have 120 loads, but that generator is going to be putting out 208. I could see where the inverters look at that voltage and go, no, something's wrong, and it won't attach. So you come up with a situation where the ACN light is flashing, saying, hey, I see an ACN, but I don't see, uh, and then the inverter light's on, so I'm not going to attach. Uh, one possibility is to leave them both as masters. Okay. And and you, if you have two load panels, essentially one off of each, each inverter, that would allow you to plug into 208, because inverter is going to be a standalone system, if you will. It's just going to see 120. Well, I have 120 one, as I have, 208 or 240 because it doesn't care what the other lag is doing. Okay. I have, it's a 120 208 system. I have one panel that I'm feeding. I have a, uh, we make the neutral common from what I remember. And then um, we have uh, double pole bus work. So if the neutral, it's mobile units that are installed. So if the neutral is common and I make both units masters, I only have one mate. Um, that would be the way to go. Make set both up as masters, both ports. It would be a way to go, yeah. Because then okay. if you plug into shore power. Well, let me ask you this: Are those two inverters expected to take shore power and generator power? Yeah, because they're fed from the main switchboard on board, so it depends on what's feeding the switchboard, whether it's being fed with shore power or generator power. Both sources would be a 120-208, correct? Correct, yes. Always? So even if they go to a different marina and they plug in, are they going to expect 208 at that marina, or are they going to expect 120-240 or 208? No, because what the boat is equipped with is a frequency converter, and um, so it takes in a wide range of voltages and a wide range of frequencies, and it makes it exactly what the boat wants. So the boat will only ever see 
uh, 120, 208, uh, three, uh, three phase, 60 hertz. You know, I would almost just wire that second unit as the second phase, you know, okay. whatever phase it's going to be. And that way, it's seen exactly what it wants, and it's passing through exactly what you expect. And when you put it out, it's going to put out exactly what you expect. Mark, so, when we're done here, I'd be happy to walk you through. Uh, okay. Uh, so I can give you a call back if you want uh, make yeah. sure what we're setting up made up with uh, A and B versus L1, L2. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, no problem. Very good. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you guys again because we're we're getting a lot of background noise here that makes it kind of hard. I don't know how much that's bleeding through. So that was the mate, and you know when you do uh, multiple units, the only way we we can do that is through a hub. So this is the the mate input we plug in here, and up to either four if it's a it's a, a, a hub four, or if it's a, a hub ten, you could put ten devices in here, and these could be any outback devices or devices. One of the things we do say is your master inverter should be plugged into port one. That's the one the one thing that we we don't care about the any of the other ones, but we really want to see the master inverter on port one or it can screw up uh, uh, communication between the units. So uh, this is the transformer that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and in that quad stack or in that dual inverter, the FP4 or the FP2, this is just sitting in the AC compartment. It, it's just buckled down in there, and you've got uh, two neutral legs and uh, two hot legs. So once that's wired into the outputs, it's just sitting across the outputs doing what it's supposed to do. We also have that PSX240, that's this device here. It's got a dual pole 25 amp breaker on here, a fan, and this turns that fan cools it down enough, so we call this a 6,000 watt transformer. This could be a step up, it could be a step down, or the load balancing as we use it for. So it can perform, you know, step up or step down functions. So kind of an all-in-one type thing. The great thing about that transformer is, is in the unlikely event that you do have one of your inverters uh, go down, you'll still get 240 out of that system. So it's a nice redundancy that you have two inverters and one of them happens to go down, you'll still get that critical 240. So you can still buy um, energy at 240. Um, I guess you'll, and you always sell at, at 240, meaning your AC output would still be 240 if the unlikely event the inverter went down. So it's a nice redundancy to, to keep the system at least going. Uh, we also just, you know, get you up on some of the other gear we've got. We've got a battery monitor, and this is strictly to, to monitor what goes into and out of your battery. So if you buy this or if you use it, one caveat is you absolutely have to make sure that there's nothing going into the batteries or out of the batteries that this doesn't see. It's a little bit like a checking account for your batteries, and as we've probably all experienced, if money comes out of your account that you don't know about and you write the check, the money isn't there anymore, and it's the same with a, with a battery. So uh, we can monitor up to three shunts, so you can have three different inputs to your battery, three outputs to your battery, however you want to balance them shunts. It's just going to look at the information from each shunt and determine whether it's going in or coming out, and it makes assessments on that information. One thing, uh, again, with the FlexNet BC or the FNDC battery monitor to note is that uh, if you have an end user or an installer that's put in, say, a 2,000 amp hour house battery bank, and they've spent some real money on that, and they also are depending on the Outback system to start a generator, the FlexNet BC can add possibly years of life to the system because it's going to be able to say it's been so many days since we've reached full. And you may not hit your 24-hour, 2-hour, 2-minute volt start through advanced generator start, but FlexNet DC is going to take that monitoring one step further and say, hey, I haven't reached a full state of charge in 20 days or 3 days. You can set that up so that it will actually say, look, it's been 3 days since we've had a full charge. I'm going to start the generator and go through a full cycle. So somebody who's expecting a battery bank to last 10 years, 12 years, and, and you get the question mark at six years, I don't understand why the battery bank didn't last. It may have been that they were chronically undercharging the system. So the FlexNet BC can add another level of check and balance to the whole system and make sure that the, uh, 
the batteries are being taken care of. And, and as an investment for a $300 device, um, it can add a couple of years to it, uh, you know, a ten dollars or $12,000 battery bank. And, it, and that's a pretty sound investment. So we also make charge controllers, and not so much on a small boat like, you know, my 27-foot uh, Ericsson uh, with one or two solar panels, I mean, or a smaller boat with one or two solar panels. This might be a bit over overkill, but nonetheless, we do make a maximum power point tracking, whereas uh, larger systems, uh, you know, on, uh, larger arrays on a boat, you this would be usable. usable. This would be a 60 on the one on the right and 80 amps into the battery on the one on the left. On the left. So I uh, just wanted to bring it out. It's got data logging and uh, a lot of great features. Uh, if you're using something like the uh, old, uh, the old um, gosh, what was the name of that um, trace unit? Um, C40s. Uh, those were not PowerPoint tracking. Uh, they would just take a 12-volt array and tie it to your 12-volt battery, and that's what you get. With this, you can go up to 150 volts on the input, usually up to three panels in a row, and then uh, tie that into a 12-volt battery system. So it, it gives you a little bit of capability as far as uh, wiring your, your solar array. Uh, one thing to note is on our inverters, we've given you a really great battery charger as far as your different options uh, with like I said earlier you could go into the charge charger and look at the charger and you can turn the charger off that means if I have an AC input you've asked me not to charge the batteries or you could turn it to on and auto and it's a five stage charging a bulk absorb silent float and EQ and those all achieve something uh, the EQ setting is if you have lead acid batteries and they're the flooded lead acid, uh, a lot of times, well, over time, it's a nice thing to give them a very high controlled voltage. And you're, this isn't a charging stage per se, but it's a maintenance charge. And what it does is it brings your batteries up to a high voltage and it tries to equalize all the cells in the battery to bring them back as close to new as possible. So that's the EQ. And, you know, a lot of times when you get a battery, they'll say, well, I want you to charge it at 2.4 volts per cell, and anything between 2.4 and 2.49 per cell is what we're looking for. And, and then what I've done here is try to say in a 12-volt system, if you've got that battery, it's 14.4 to 14.94. Anything in there might be good. 24-volt uh, system, 28.8 to 29.8. A 48-volt system, 57 to 59. So our... Our normal setting is at this lower number, 57.6, 28.8, 14.4, and that's going to be good for an AGM style battery. So again, you'll see the absorbed voltage, or excuse me, the uh, EQ voltage is substantially higher than your normal charging, and there's also the float set point. You can set these, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the Freedom Marine. Uh, that unit, you would say, I've got a lead acid battery, and it would say, all right, I'm going to do this. You could say, I've got a uh, gel style battery, or I've got an AGM style one or two, and it would go to a certain profile. With ours, we don't want to pick your profile. We let you do it. So if your battery wants, says, I want to see 14.7, you can program it for 14.7. It just goes through, and, and you can really tie this down to give the batteries the best thing you want. And batteries are like women. If you give them what they want, they'll be happy. So not always achievable, but nonetheless. Uh, so this is the charging mode in the auto mode. And usually on a boat, if you're not using a generator, this is a very good setting. And what it's going to do is you're out cruising around, uh, you're out fishing, you're out, you know, having fun, doing whatever you do on a boat, and you come back in and you plug it into shore power. This is going to take a low battery voltage here, and we're going to give it a constant current. We're going to try to give it either as much current as the batteries will accept, or as much current as we can possibly give into our maximum. So what it happens is we try to bring it up to that absorbed setting, whatever you told it to go to, and then at that point we just hold that voltage for time. So once you hit here, this point right here, your batteries are at a certain amount of charge. If it's uh, 
If it's a lead acid battery, this could be 80 to 85 percent. If it's an AGM battery, this is probably more in the low 90s. So this point here can really vary depending on the type of battery you have. So then we say, well, hold this voltage for time. And this is your absorbed time. From the factory, this is one hour. You could set this from uh, zero to six minutes or up to 24 hours. So it's totally adjustable how, how long you adjust that for. It just depends on the size of your battery and how many inverters and all your charging sources. So in the, in the auto mode, at the end of this absorbed time, we go quiet. We stop charging and we wait. If your batteries fall back down, say they weren't 100% charged, say your bilge pump turns on, say you've left a couple lights on your boat that you didn't know about, as your batteries deplete, when you hit this level here, it says, all right, now I'm going to go through a float cycle. I'm going to refloat the batteries. I'm going to bring them up to that float voltage and just charge them at a much lower voltage. And at the end of the float time, I'm going to go silent. So on a boat, this is great because if you plug in and, and I, like I said, I was in the Everett Marina and you would see people that, uh, go to their boat, plug it in, and then they walk away and they don't come back for weeks, sometimes even a month or more. And what would happen is it would just go through that absorbed, stop charging, and then if your batteries drop down to a lower level, it would just gently float your batteries, and this could last for months. And this way you're not subjecting your batteries to a constant voltage. They're not constantly being charged at that float level and just being held at an unnatural voltage. You're letting your batteries go through a small cycle. And that's the auto mode. The on mode, and this is better for perhaps a generator. And why I say that is, well, you're out at sea and you, the guy's fishing. And he's got his generator running to run some big loads. What's going to happen is when he turns that generator on, we're going to go through a charge cycle. And we're going to do the same thing as before. We're going to go through the absorb cycle. But instead of going silent, what it does is it lets the batteries drift down to a, a lower value, and it just gently floats your batteries, just like you would ensure at the float value. It's the same value, and you've got a time. And it's just going to go right to float, and it's just going to hold that float forever. And the reason this is nice with a generator is say you're running your generator anyway. If, if you had an automatic gen start, we're going to go through this bulk, through the absorb cycle, and your generator will be told to shut off at this time. So we have put about 90, no, 80 to 93 percent into your batteries. We'll hold it for a time, try to get them as close to 99 as we can, or 100, and then we shut it off and it stops. But if you're running your generator, you're fishing, you're running lights at night, your generator's running, why not just let that keep going and you'll just get a nice charge into your batteries. That way, when you shut that generator off, not only did we fill your batteries up here, but we've really topped them off here. So the difference in the two modes and how they work. Uh, we also offer a, a set of batteries. We were purchased about two years ago now by the Alpha Group. And it's a consortium of uh, several companies that are really big in the telecom industry. They're a worldwide organization. They've, they're uh, a quite large company. Uh, and they said, you guys are kind of missing the boat. You ought to offer some batteries. And, uh, of course, we don't sell batteries or we don't make batteries. We make inverters and charge controllers. So they had a, a good relationship with C&D batteries, and that's who create these batteries. These are a valve-regulated batteries. Some people call them a sealed battery. Uh, sealed batteries are never sealed. There's a valve right here, so if they're overcharged, some reason need to vent, this vent allows that. So usually a sealed battery is a misnomer. A valve-regulated battery is probably a better thing to say. These are front front uh, uh, terminals on these, so instead of having them on top, you can slip this back into a compartment and just have this much exposed. Uh, one of the nice things is we got this little safety cover for it, and uh, truth in lending here, we call this an RE200. They weigh about 115 pounds each, and at the 100-hour rate, it's 200 amp hours. Realistically, in the RE world, we call this a, a 24 hour amp hour battery. At the 24 discharge rate, it's 181 amp hours. Another nice thing about this is, well, first of all, here's the size. You see the dimensions up here on this, five inches wide, 11 high, 22, 22 deep. 
And this little thing right here, as silly as it is, is wonderful. What this is is a bar that comes with the batteries, and it allows you to make a very good connection between the two batteries. So if you've got a 24 bank battery, you can just put these across it. Now you've got a 24 across these two terminals. Uh, I see a lot of people go ahead and they'll make the battery connections, put them in a loop. You've got to buy that cable. You've got to buy the ends. You have to put the cramp the ends on them. And tell you the truth, that little cramp right there, some or the crimp right there, is not always a good crimp. Uh, you can go through and that's a certain spot where your battery could fail because of a simple wiring issue between the two batteries. Um, so as silly as this is, this is a very nice feature and it can save you a lot of time. And Mark, I'm going to unmute you. Is uh, you all right? Is there anything you care to add or talk about? Yeah. No, I'm good. Okay. I'll mute you back up and I'll, I'll talk. I'll connect from time to time. Fred, I don't know if you if you have a vocal ready yet, but I just wanted to give you a chance to talk if you want it. Okay. Kind of going back to the FlexNet DC and the batteries, you can see uh, the cycle life. If you're down to 50%, you're getting 1,800 cycles. If your discharge is at 20%, now you're getting a significantly higher 5,700. Um, Typically, with uh, the state of charge, you don't ever want to, if you want to get the max out of your number of cycles out of your batteries, you don't ever want to discharge the batteries below 30% as a rule of thumb because it starts to drop off very, very quickly after that. And so, again, with the FlexNet DC, the FlexNet DC can say, oh, my state of charge is 30%. I'm going to go ahead and start the generator. So that's another way that you can bring another device in, the FlexNet DC, and actually have the system take care of the batteries a lot sooner than what the uh, advanced generator start would, which would be you know a 24-hour, two-hour, two-minute. You could be at that 10-hour mark, and really the batteries could use a charge, but you haven't hit those voltages yet, and you're not going to hit them uh, the 24-hour voltage for you know another uh, 14 hours. Get those batteries back up, get them charged again. So the generator may feel like it's running a little more often. Uh, say with the FlexNet DC in there, but uh, the upside though is, is now you've taken those batteries from a six-year battery possibly up to a 10-year battery life. Hey Mark, what, what type of batteries do you use on, on your, your, your installs? Um, I, I've had pretty good luck with the North Stars, which is kind of a telecommunications battery like this because we're typically not cycling very hard or very often because the boats have seamless transfer and stuff. It just happens to be when they lose power for short periods of time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Are One they other question. sealed battery or lead acid? Um, that's an AGM battery, I believe. Okay, that would probably be sealed then. Yeah, it's sealed. You definitely can't put water in it, but it, it's a similar sizes it's five inches wide and same size okay one other one other question on the battery charger if you turn it to on it will it will come out of absorption go to float um, but then after that time period that you set in the mate after that time period runs out then it'll go to silent mode and only refloat when it hits that refloat voltage or no no if the, if the charger is set to on it'll mm -hmm. drift down and hit the float and just float it until you unplug it okay okay and, you know, some batteries just go, yeah, float me, I don't care, you know. Mm -hmm. But some batteries go, hey, I don't want to have this constant voltage on me. And, okay. you know, if you're in a marina and you're constantly having that voltage on there, maybe the batteries don't need it and you're paying for energy that you really don't need to use. Okay, okay. One situation where you would want to have the charger on um, would be if you had a lithium pack in there with a battery management system because typically battery management systems want to have power available so they can balance the batteries, charge them, do whatever they need to do, which the Outback system is blind to. So by turning that charger on, you're always making that available to uh, that lithium battery pack. Okay. Yeah, lithium batteries are a, kind of a new advent. They're a real interesting, a, a lot of stuff going on with them. Uh, they have what we call, what they call a BMS, a battery management system. So they want to see one voltage, one voltage only, and then we'll do what we want with that voltage. So uh, let's keep going. Whoa, 
Okay, I, actually, I think that's it. So, listen, I'm going to go back to the beginning here, and let's go back up over here. And I wanted to do one thing with this. Um, Fred, uh, this is John's number and tech support. Uh, if you have any questions about this or anything you wanted to, any, yeah, any questions or anything you wanted to add, why don't you write down John's number there and give him a call. I mean, you know, I, I, I really like having the, the feedback. And, and Mark, I really appreciate the feedback you've given us. Uh, it's, it's really nice. Like I say, I'm not used to talking to a computer screen. It's nice. Like I say, I'm not used to talking to a computer screen. Okay. Yeah, if um, one of you all have a chance to contact me about that system we're putting in now with the three-phase, that'd be great. Yeah, okay, or I can call, you, I can call John. Call on that. Okay. Well, gentlemen, our hour is almost up. Unless there's any questions, uh, boy, uh, first of all, Mark, thank you very much for showing up and, con and contributing to up Ned. If you, if you want to call us, please do. Okay, thank you. You guys have a great day, and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.